Thanks, Cole. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike. I'm going to be speaking on this parable this morning, so please keep your uh, Bibles open there at Matthew chapter 20. We've been going through Luke's Gospel, and uh, I feel like the last few weeks listening to Jesus and his parables, he's really kind of stuck his fingers under our ribs and kind of, you know, uh, pressed into the, the deep recesses of our hearts to, uh, to challenge the way that we think about the world and think about ourselves. And so I thought, why not do another parable, but this time from Matthew, and uh, we can just feel the sting and the pain a little bit longer as Jesus gives us another hard parable to challenge our hearts, especially around our generosity and the principles of grace. So let's uh, pray as we come to hear um, or explore this passage a bit more this morning. Our Father, we do thank you that you are a good and gracious God, uh, that you are a God that speaks uh, hard truths to us about ourselves so that we might understand how we stand before you and how we stand only by your grace. So, Father, we pray that you would help us this morning to understand how your kingdom operates as Jesus reveals the kingdom to us and that we might understand how your kingdom operates on the principles of grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I wonder if you, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have a, uh, a favourite saying that perhaps captures your own kind of work ethic, your own work ethos. My uh, pop used to have a very favourite saying, which was, uh, working will and wishing won't. So you'd say, Pop, I wish I had a new mountain bike. And you'd say, no, working will, wishing won't. I'd say, sure. I don't know what that means. You know, work harder, I guess. Yeah. I, I wish I could you know, be a YouTube star. Well, you know, working will, wishing won't. I wish I could afford a house in Sydney. Working will, wishing won't. Maybe working will, I guess that's the, that's the point. Um, but my pop was also, he was a moderately successful farmer in South Australia, but he was also dead at 65, and I think that was from overwork. And so maybe that proverb can't necessarily be trusted. Maybe we should look to someone else's wisdom, someone who really has brought themselves out of poverty into some of the, the, the greatest riches and wealth and fame of our time. And I'm talking about Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Any fans here? <laughs> some of you follow him on Instagram, on Twitter, you've seen his movies, no doubt. Um, he has a production company called Seven Bucks uh, Production Company um, because that's a reference to the fact when he was at his lowest, when he'd hit rock bottom, pun intended, he only had $7 in his pocket. And then from there, he has become the wealthiest person in Hollywood, the most wealthy, the most well-known actor in Hollywood. And so here's some of the wisdom that you can glean from him as you just scroll through his Instagram feed or his Twitter feed. The Rock says, uh, when opportunities aren't coming fast enough, sometimes you just got to create them yourself. Hashtag take the first step, right? Good advice. The Rock says, while everyone else sleeps, we grind. Hashtag team bring it, right? Is anyone feeling inspired? <laughs> what about this one? The Rock says, success, chase it. Respect, earn it. Love, embrace it. Probably with these actions as well. <laughs> Hashtag team bring it, right? You bring your best to everything. I I'm feeling inspired already. But what do those kind of sayings say about the value of human life? When we start to think about people, when we start to think about success, when we start to think about life itself by really economic standards and principles. That's what The Rock's kind of talking about here. That's what my grandfather was talking about, that working will and wishing won't. I mean, does it mean that we really end up undervaluing people? Well, we really only believe that someone is worth only the amount of what they can do, right? Maybe that's the result of capitalism, where now we have companies that are only full of human resources and no longer persons, personnel, right? You're a human resource, not a person. Or perhaps do we overvalue people when we think about humans in economic terms? Do we believe everyone is actually worth the same despite what they can contribute and what they do. You know, I guess the result of that would be communism or a socialist kind of philosophy. Now, what do you actually believe about the value of people as you think about your own work ethic and as you think about those around you? I mean, if you look at our world and how we operate in practice, I mean, we pay people different wages, we pay people different salaries, and so I guess that means we believe that some people deserve more and others deserve less. 
But then, of course, we also fight for equal pay. And when you look at our world, we recognise different classes in our society, working class, middle class, you know, upper class or whatever new classes there are. Um, some have to be at the top, but I guess some have to be at the bottom. But then we also believe in equal opportunity. Everyone has the opportunity to be miserable. Uh, we believe in a fair go, right? That's what this country is about, a fair go uh, for all, despite race and creed or colour. Um, but really, maybe we re believe that some deserve to live here more than others because we do deny some people groups and some individuals the right to live here, right? Certain, certain immigrants who travel here by certain means, even. What about as we think about ourselves as Australian? We love to talk about the Australian spirit of mateship, you know, pulling together for the common good. But then we also really love to complain a lot, especially around tax time. You know, others deserve to pay more tax because he's, he's richer than I am. He should pay more and I definitely deserve to pay less. And so I will exercise my right to do so with creative accounting. Right? This is the tension I think that we feel in this parable that Jesus has set uh, before us. It's between two things that we believe in equally. It's a tension between fairness and equality. Those two things. It's a, it's a tension I think that we feel very early in life. I mean, I know as a kid, I remember kind of comparing um, the glasses of cordial with my siblings to make sure they didn't have a millimetre more than I did. I saw my own kids do this the other day when we had a special drink at home, a juice or something, and they were kind of all lining them up on the bench just to see who had more than the other, you know, to make sure it was equal and fair, right? Uh, it's the, uh, perhaps even the first reality check that you get when you're younger, being able to pick um, a team, a sports team, and realising that actually there are some people you want on your team and some people you don't want on your team. And, and I'm sorry if it's bringing up all kinds of terrible memories for you about being picked last. Um, but we recognise that some people are better at some things than others. We realise there's that diversity. And we know that equality is right and just and fair. And we, we also know that some are deserving more than others in different areas of life. And that it's often not fair to give to everyone equally. I mean, why should the year nine checkout boy get the same pay as the CEO of Woolworths? Right, that wouldn't be fair, would it? And doesn't the kingdom of heaven sometimes raise the same questions for us? Now, if you have someone who devotes their whole life to serving Jesus, to denying themselves, why should the one who lives their entire life in rebellion against God, their entire life in contemptuous ignorance or their entire life in willful disobedience, why should they receive the same salvation that you receive? The same salvation that comes in Jesus if they just repent and trust in his name. I mean, is everyone truly equal in God's kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven? I mean, don't some work harder than others, even in, you know, the physical manifestation of the kingdom as the church, right? There's the person who turns up to everything, the one who serves on every committee, the one who gives more money, gives more time, who's first to arrive and last to leave. And don't they deserve more than the one who's always missing, who's rarely on time, who's always needy or who's barely on the roster or whatever it's going to be? Is the kingdom of God fair? That's the question that Jesus challenges us with this morning. Now, the context of this parable, because we haven't been going through uh, Matthew, is that Jesus has been turning our world upside down. Um, he's been revealing how God's kingdom operates. And in chapter 19, verse 30, and again here in chapter 20, verse 16, he drops this little riddle, this little kind of phrase that talks about the paradigm of how the kingdom of God operates. He says this, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. And again in chapter 20, verse 16, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. And he's illustrated this little paradigm of the kingdom previously in chapter 19 uh, with two interactions with the little children who are the lowest in society, and he raises them. And then he... Uh, he uh, he also illustrates this in an interaction with the rich man, who I guess is one of the, the highest in society, but he lowers him. And we find out that those who have much miss out, 
and those who give up and who rely and depend on others gain more. And then just after this passage in chapter um, 20, we see that the Son of Man, Jesus himself, must die. He goes to give up his life so that he might be raised to new life. And then in chapter 20, verses 20 to 28, he finishes off with this wonderful kind of phrase where he says, again, whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. What a challenge that even as we follow after the Lord Jesus, the one who is first becomes last so that he might be made first again. Let me pray as we just explore this, uh, prepare our hearts, I guess, to explore this parable that little bit more. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would challenge our hearts this morning. We pray, Father, that you would turn our world upside down so that our hearts might be the right way up. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just two points I want to make out of this parable this morning. And here is the first. The first secret that Jesus reveals about the kingdom is about the kingdom and fairness. Let me read for you this parable again, verses 1 to 7. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, right near the end of the working day, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? It's because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. Right? In a sense, verses 1 to 7 are really just setting up the scene for the crazy twist that's about to happen in verses 8 to 10. So let me read those for you. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last, uh, last one's hired, and then going on to the first. The workers who were hired at about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. Hello. So when they came and were hired first, uh, so when those who came were hired first, they expected to receive more. But then each one of them also received a denarius. Scandalous. Right? This is what the kingdom of heaven is like, says Jesus. And does that seem fair to you? Right? This is the criticism that the first workers bring to the master of the house, to the landowner. It's not fair. Right? Verse 11 to 12, and on receiving it, the denarius, they grumbled at the master of the house saying, these last worked one hour, only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. It's absolutely not fair. Now, as you sit here and read this parable and hear it again and again, who do you identify with in this parable? Because you should see yourself in here somewhere. I think most of us naturally, because I do this almost every time, I'm naturally drawn to the first workers and I really feel, feel those pangs of injustice. You know, every moment that my brother got to do something that I didn't get to do, every moment that someone else got raised, you know, higher above me or got a special privilege that I didn't get, I feel the pangs of injustice here. And I think we often see ourselves in this parable as the ones who missed out. We don't often see ourselves as the last workers, as those who received generosity. And what does that say about us? What does that say about our hearts? Because who you identify with in this parable actually determines the lesson for you. Now, if it's the first workers, then this is the lesson. The lesson is about grumbling. That's what they do, and that's what they are. They are grumblers. And in the Bible, some of the most sudden and severe punishments fall upon those who grumble. 
And you think of the wilderness generation that were rescued out of slavery in Egypt and brought out into the wilderness and fed and given food and water and even quail, all those wonderful things, but they grumbled and the Lord destroyed a great multitude of them. And then grumbling is also, especially in the Old Testament, usually the mark of someone who doesn't quite understand grace. And so think of the prophet Jonah, for instance. God shows mercy to Nineveh and he sits and he whinges. He grumbles under a tree. Or perhaps even the Pharisees in Matthew's Gospel, back in chapter 9, verse 11, who grumble about Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors. But actually, there, there is no injustice here in this parable. Right? The master of the house makes clear that the only problem for these workers is their envy. Verse 13, he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Right? The master has been fair. He has paid what they agreed. He has paid the standard day's wage. He has not cheated them of anything. The first workers are only disappointed because of what could have been. Right? They could have worked a lot less and got paid a lot more like those that only joined at the 11th hour. Now, I'm a notoriously bad haggler. I shouldn't be admitting this in public, just in case I want to you know, buy something off you one day. Um, but sometimes I venture to try and bargain just a little bit with someone. I'm getting a little bit better at it, so someone will you know, want a price, $250 for something, and I'll say, uh, well, let's knock off 50 bucks. I'll pay you $200 and deal. And then when they say yes at the first offer, instead of rejoicing, I feel cheated. <laughs> I feel cheated because then I think to myself, maybe actually they would have gone lower. Like, what did they accept so soon? And instead of thinking about the discount I got, I'm now wondering, well, maybe I could have got so much more. I, I'm now I start to grumble within myself, right? I feel like I've missed out. And I think that's the feeling that these workers have. That's what I, that's what I can empathise with them about. That's why they grumble. But in the end, they got what they deserved. They got what they agreed upon, nothing more. And the last workers, who almost don't deserve anything, well, certainly not a day's pay, well, they have received an abundant, generous amount. See, this parable really isn't about pay. It's about generosity. What does the landowner say? I choose to give to the last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you just begrudge my generosity to others? Well, I think it's quite difficult for us to get past this tension. But if the kingdom of God is like this, the question is, where do you feel the question uh, the kingdom of God is unfair? Where do you feel envious of others in the kingdom of God? Where do you resent others in the kingdom of God? You know, do you begrudge others for their giftedness and their skills that you would so long to have? Do you resent others who are able to get married and have got married and, but you have missed out? Do you resent those who earn more money than you? Do you resent those who maybe have uh, little or no hardship in their lives, or at least it appears so? Do you resent being made equal with people who were liars, adulterers, thieves, drunkards and lazy gluttons? Where do you think God's kingdom is unfair? And what does that say about our hearts? You see, the truth is that we might find ourselves identifying with the first workers, feeling their pangs of injustice. But really, all of us in this parable are like the late workers. You know, none of the workers have the right to complain because God is always fair, and in fact, more than that, he is exceedingly generous. And so here is the second secret 
Jesus reveals about the kingdom. And it's about the kingdom and generosity. Right? Everything in this parable relies on the generosity of the master. Did you notice that great, the grace that lies beneath the whole story? It runs like the vein through this whole parable. We're likely to miss it because we take God's generosity for granted and we feel like it's God's job to be generous to us. Right? That's what he does. It's his job to look after me. It's his job just to be there when I need him. It's his job to provide. It's his job to forgive. But even in this parable, the master doesn't owe employment to anybody. Right? He didn't have to go out and find those workers and offer them a day's work and a day's pay at all. But he goes and he chooses them, he approaches them, he chooses them, he offers them what is good and fair and then even what is generous to those who would join at the 11th hour at the 5pm in the afternoon. He didn't have to pay even a denarius to those he hired first. He didn't have to give them a day's wage, he could have haggled, he could have offered them less and see how low they would go. Isn't that what we learn in economics? It's a free market, so if you just kind of choose a bit lower, like maybe, maybe you'll get away with a great deal. He could have been tight, but he wasn't, and he isn't. Right? God is the master here of the vineyard. He doesn't owe employment to anybody. It's his prerogative to be generous with his good gifts. And the good news is that he is generous. But the kingdom of God does not operate on the principles of economics. The value of human beings is not based on their work output. It's not based on your utility or your resourcefulness. And that is very good news for each of us if you are a worker in his vineyard, if you belong to his kingdom. Whether you are like one of the first workers or the last, but especially so, if you identify yourself as a late worker, the ones who've received more than they deserved. And isn't this truly what the kingdom of God is like, that Jesus illustrates time and time again? This whole section here in Matthew's Gospel just repeatedly makes this point. A little bit earlier, he says the kingdom of God is for little children, it's for those who depend on God for everything. The kingdom is not for the worthy and the self-sufficient. It's not for those who think they can demonstrate why they deserve God's generosity and grace. What did Jesus say to the little children? But let them come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And the kingdom is not for the rich and the religiously disciplined. It's for those who give up what they have to depend solely on Jesus. This is what Jesus said to the rich young ruler. He said, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. He has missed out. And the kingdom is not for those who want to be served. It's for those who want to serve. So Jesus says after this parable in chapter 20, verse 27, Whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And isn't this what we remind ourselves with constantly as we're in the habit of confessing our sins? As good Anglicans, we've done it this morning already, you've read the words on the screen, but did you pray those words? Did you understand that actually it is you who's confessing your sin and your unworthiness, your dependence for each one of us, so that nobody here has the right to think of themselves more highly than anyone else here? Whether you've been a Christian for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, or maybe you're just thinking about entering the kingdom this morning. We confess our sins because it reminds us of God's great generosity in sending his son the first to become the last, so that we might be first with him. So here's the tough questions, I think, from this parable. Do you see God's generosity to you? Do you see God's generosity to you everywhere, in everything that you have? And are you thankful to him? Perhaps 
Do you feel you are more deserving of his grace than others? And if so, do you grumble? Or do you feel that you are undeserving of his generosity? Well then, are you depending on his grace in Jesus? The grace that he gives to you freely and generously. Because God's kingdom does not operate on the principles of economics, you are worth far more than your utility by what you do or achieve. Because the gospel, the kingdom of God, operates on the principles of grace. So let's give thanks and pray as we finish. Our Father, we do thank you that you are a good and generous God that you have given to us more than we deserve, that you have sought us out and brought us into your vineyard, into your kingdom. Father, please make us thankful people. Please open our eyes to see the ways that you have been abundantly generous to us, even when life is hard, or especially when life is hard. Father, please help us to depend only on the Lord Jesus and put our trust in him for our righteousness. And Father, we rejoice with all those who come into the kingdom, whether they've been here for some time or will come in late at the 11th hour. Father, we thank you. Your salvation is for all. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.